think about the place where I was born, the village school, the winding lane, the fields of waving corn. He that dreams brought memories to me. My childhood days, in fancy I could see. When the sun had gone to rest and I was tired of play, Dad would put me on his back and then to me he'd say, Up the, the spirit of the house. By Michael Robson. Mr. Wedderburn? Indeed, sir. Uh, and you would be uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hepton? Uh, Lennox? Oh, yes, of course, of course. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> uh, from Hong Kong. That's right. <laughs> You've had our recent letter. Hong Kong? What a very long way to travel for a house. Oh, for a home, Mr. Wedderburn. Oh, to be sure. Uh, please, uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. <clears throat> Have you had any luck, Mr. Wedderburn, with the kind of house my husband and I are looking for? Well, I have some photographs of properties to show you, of course. Though with your having lived abroad so long... Most of our lives. Uh, it's quite so. Having lived in the Far East so long, you may perhaps have no conception of the way the value of properties in England has increased latterly. Especially, if I may say so, here in the Cotswolds. Uh, ah, here we are. Ah, a house of the order, the specifications you set out in your letter, Mr Lennox, is now a little gold mine to its owners. A veritable little gold mine. <clears throat> We've been away from England for 35 years, Mr. Wedderburn, apart from a few home leaves, and what we want more than anything else is to have a home of our own in the Cotswolds by Christmas. Now, can you help us? <clears throat> you know Woodstock? Well, we know of it, of course. Charming little market town, about six miles from Oxford. A couple of interesting properties there. Uh, you see this one? Uh -huh. Queen Anne House in the main street. Excellent condition, full of character. But we emphasised, Mr. Wedderburn, that the house we have in mind will be entirely detached, in its own grounds, with a decent lawn and a kitchen garden. Would we get all those in Woodstock? Uh, if it's the price we mentioned that's been worrying you, uh, we should prefer to see the property first in any event, and if we find one that suits us, Let's we... say that we're perfectly prepared to pay the right price for the right property. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, we could cast our net much wider. Uh, to Treem, for example. Treem? Enchanting little village on the borders of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. Well, that sounds very much the area we have in mind. You know of a property there, Mr Wedderburn? Yes. This chap. Rather large, perhaps, but it does possess most of the prerequisites you set down in your correspondence. Here. Chaloners. This is it? The house called Chaloners? That's the fella, just on the edge of the village. Tudor. Dormer windows. Big sweeping drive, broad garden. The dick! This is precisely the house I've been talking about ever since we first started planning retirement. <laughs> you know this house, Mrs. Lennox? Oh, not physically, of course not. I've never visited that part of England before. But I had this total and detailed vision of the kind of house I wanted. The house I knew we should eventually live in. Uh, Alison, uh, my wife, has thought and talked of little else for months on end, Mr. Wedderburn. On the voyage home, she even planned the decorations for each and every room. But there... Without looking at the specifications, I can tell you that there's oak flooring in the hall, isn't there? A wide staircase that halfway up divides to right and left to meet the first landing. Two master bedrooms, two guest rooms and two modernised bathrooms. Accurate in every particular. Astonishing. I knew this was how it would be. Well, when do we visit Challenger's, Mr Wedderburn? quite a considerable property. Yeah. It's, uh, well, rather more, I should have thought, than the two of you might reasonably require. It's perfect. Down to the last detail, it's perfect. And exactly as I'd imagined it. Uh, why are, um, uh, why are the present owners wanting to sell? Uh, Colonel Maitland's the owner. His wife, um, 
passed away here after what can only be described as a mercifully short illness. Oh, I'm sorry. The Colonel had no wish to stay on here afterwards, not with so many memories. They'd been, well, quite extraordinarily happy here. I feel that. Yes, I feel that. So the Colonel went to London. He has a flat there, in fact, but well, I understand he spends most of his time at his club. And the furniture, all this furniture and the paintings, the carpets, the fixtures and fittings, uh, what does Colonel Maitland intend to do with them? He would prefer, he would wish, that whoever bought the property might also buy its contents as well. Of course, they may not be entirely to everyone's liking. I like them enormously, don't we, Dick? Well, I... Like them enormously? In perfect harmony with the spirit of the house. Well, they're charming. Quite charming. But presumably your own furniture will be in storage now, against your eventual purchase of a house. Well, everything we had, we left in Hong Kong. Everything. Well, uh, except for our toothbrushes, of course, and the clothes we stand up in. <laughs> Wasn't that perhaps it rather... a clean break with the past. That's what we decided on, Mr Wedderburn. An end to our old life in the East, and a new beginning to our life in England. Shorn of all mementos, all associations... What's Colonel Maitland asking for the house and grounds alone? As I warned you earlier, once we enter the area of a property like Challoners, we are talking of quite a considerable figure. After all, in the heart Dick, of the Cotswolds... whatever the asking price, I think we shall pay it. I know it'll be more than we expected to pay, but... Well, I mean, just look at it. It's perfect. Mm. Mr Wedderburn, if I wrote you a cheque now, an outright purchase, with none of the tedium and delays of a mortgage... Could you see your way clear to offering us very favourable terms for the entire contents of the house and outbuildings, exactly as we've just seen them? Mr Lennox, I am perfectly certain we can come to an agreement acceptable to all parties. <laughs> and that being so, I have every reason to believe that you and Mrs Lennox will be firmly and, I'm certain, happily ensconced here at Challoners in good time for Christmas. Doesn't it look marvellous? Absolutely marvellous. Everything prepared and just one thing missing. Oh, what's that? I can't think of anything. It's turkey ready for the oven. Mm. Plum pudding standing by for a final steam. <laughs> Wine in the cellar. Holly and mistletoe in the hall. <laughs> and that enormous Christmas tree. You are an old fusspot, darling. What could possibly be missing? Well, you know... Christmas cards. But why on earth should we expect Christmas cards? We haven't sent any. Mm. Nobody knows we're here except Mr Wedderburn. And I don't imagine, however sweet he may be, that he sends Christmas cards to all his clients. Oh, what does it matter anyway? We're here. Challoners is ours. Signed, sealed and delivered. And we're spending our very first English Christmas together mm. in exactly the place we've always dreamed about. The house you've always known about, somehow or other. <laughs> Wasn't that a clever one? <laughs> oh, Dick, let's not potter about soberly until this evening. I really do fancy a drink. Yes. Something bright and sharp. And why not, for heaven's sake? What'll it be? I think a gin and French, darling. Uh-huh. And more gin and... What's that? What's what? A noise outside. Sounds as if someone's arrived in a motor. Well, go and look, sweetheart. Perhaps it's our first guest of the season. But where is it? Well, if it really is visitors, they'll have drawn up outside the front door, won't they? Here's your drink. Dick, God, we're here. there's no car anywhere. Good night, man. What? Are you going to give me a hand with this luggage or not? Why the hell should I? You're supposed to be the well, strong man. Well, that's odd. I can hear the voices, but I can't see anyone. I'm driving tonight, so you can do some bloody lifting. Oh, it's uncanny. What's that? Oh, this is mad. Someone's opened the front door. Is it my fault you have a hangover? Ridiculous party last night instead of coming on There's voices. Plan. They're in the hall. You were the huh? one who fancied having a ball at Douglas's, not me. Where are you going? What? I'm going upstairs. Oh. I'm going upstairs to wash and change, and I hope when I come down, you'll be in a better mood. If you recall, darling, it was you who bickered all the way down from London. The way you were driving, any normal person would have gone really oh. mad. Give me a break, will you, Daphne? We're here for five days, so let's just try to get up on the right foot for once in a while. He's 
house in the other room, the study. I'm going out there. Sort it out. No, no, no. Wait a moment. They might be dangerous. I hope you aren't starting on the booze already. You downed enough last night to think a battleship. Yeah, while you were taking enough aboard to float a bloody aircraft carrier. Oh, George. When you weren't creeping into the kitchen for a fumble and a grunt with Douglas. My God. What about you and that little bitch Moira? Couldn't keep your hands on her the entire evening. The difference what? between Douglas and Moira, my pet, <clears throat> was that while Moira was sober and affectionate, Douglas he's pouring a drink. He's in the study together. pouring himself a drink in our house. Nothing else. You might at least run me a bar. Well, I've had enough of this. Come on. Oh, be careful. Be careful. Oh. My God. What is going on in this house? There's no one here. But there must have been. He made a drink. He made himself a drink. We heard the siphon going. We don't have a soda siphon. And we don't keep the drinks in here. Or perhaps he's gone upstairs. But we didn't see him coming out of here, did we? Dick, someone, two people, two foul-mouthed, disgusting people are in our house. You'll have to find them and get rid of them, even if it means bringing in the police. Well, for God's sake, if we can't see them, how are we supposed to throw them out? No one at all, anywhere. But we heard them. Both of us heard them. Alison, there is no one in this house apart from ourselves. No people, no luggage, no belongings, nothing. But we can't have imagined it. Those voices, that quarrel. Well, let's go back to the study for a moment. It's just possible. What's just possible? Well, you were listening to the wireless before lunch, weren't you? To that carol service. Yes. Then you can't have switched it off. But you did. Well, of course I did. I switched it off and went to the kitchen to see to the potatoes. Well, there must be a faulty connection somewhere. But it must have come on again somehow. And switched itself off again when that, that man went out of the room. Oh, don't be ridiculous. But what other explanation is there? I mean, I ask you, what other explanation is there? We've been over the conversation the they row. had. All right, the row. We've been over that. And we both heard exactly the same words. And since I don't believe in collective hallucination, then the only answer must be a faulty wireless set. A play, you think? Some peculiar modern play? Well, clearly. Yes, but the language, Dick, awful. Well, surely they wouldn't allow that kind of language on the BBC. Now, look, we've satisfied ourselves there's no one inside the house, nor is there a car outside. So the set must be faulty. I'll unplug it and we shan't be bothered again. Damn it all, we're rational human beings. Heading for the land of dreams When I look back to those happy childhood days Like yesterday, it seems It was when my mother held my hand And daddy was the old D.D. Climbing up the wooden hill to Bedfordshire They were very happy days for me Oh, do come to bed. You're so much more comforting than this hot water bottle. I can't get any used to the wretched thing. Oh, well, it's been a lovely day after all. Well, you were obviously right about those voices on the wireless. There's not a murmur since you unplugged it. There's always a rational explanation for these things if you just keep cool and look for it. <laughs> ah, hoarfrost beginning. Do you know, with a bit of luck, we might actually have a white Christmas day. Oh, wouldn't it be marvellous? Oh, just think. The first snow we'll have seen for, oh, what, 30 years? Just about. Mustn't bank on it, though. Shove over, then. Oh. Give a chap a little leg room. Oh. Ah. Oh, you are cold. Oh. <laughs> oh. Ah. Mm. I suppose. Mm hmm you wouldn't care to tell me what you've got me for Christmas? I certainly would not. <laughs> we'll do it exactly as we planned. In the dining room, drinks in our hands, just before the meal of the day, then we'll exchange presents. You are mean. Oh, now, have I ever asked you what you... Why are you choosing to spend the night in there? Oh, no. I should have thought it was obvious. You're drunk again, and I'm not having you walling round me all night, <sighs> and we can I get a celery. For God's sake, <laughs> it's Christmas, isn't it? If we 
can't drink now. When can we bloody Who's drink? Who's speaking? Who's you speaking? Smashed before we before we even got to the Sherwoods. Smashed and showing off. That dreadful double act you insisted on performing with that creepy Adrian thing. <laughs> Embarrassing. I could have thrown up on the spot. You know what they call Will you? you? Stop it. Huh? The Sherwoods. Ice cold Daphne. Better that than drunk and groping George. So I got plastered, didn't everyone? What the hell's the harm in that? The harm? Oh, just ask Molly Pardo. She'll tell you what the harm was. Couldn't keep your hands off her either, What's could you? What's that supposed to mean? Whoever you are, wherever you are, this charade has gone too far. All night long, panting after her like a are randy... Are you of... so bloody insecure that you have to suspect me of having it off with every woman I meet? Get them out of here before I go mad! I prefer it if you were unfaithful. Better that than always promising what you never deliver. If you're going to start on that tack again... You're better off on your own. Oh, is the message at last beginning to get through? The message is very, very clear. I'll have more fun with a bottle of scotch than with you in your present mood. I warn you, George. If you are groaning round with a hangover in the morning, I shall drive straight back to London. That's a deal. This is intolerable. That woman is still here. She's lying between us. There is nobody here. There... There never was anyone here. We couldn't see them, we couldn't touch them. But we heard them. It, it's preposterous. It's impossible. It, it's happened, but it's impossible. The door opened, and no one opened it. We heard their voices, and we saw nothing. And the door slammed, and no one slammed it. So, the place is haunted. Well, if it isn't, then we're both insane. Both of us suffering from the same hallucination. Darling, we spent a great deal of money buying this place. More than we could sensibly afford. Somehow or other, we'll get to the bottom of this. We we've got to. I'm not going to be driven out of my house by a pair of vicious ghosts. I'll tell you this much. I am not going to spend another minute in this room. Well, not with that woman in my bed. We'll take the bedding downstairs to the drawing room. Make up the fire, have a drink, a pot of tea. We'll feel better then. And in the morning, I'll go through every room in the house with a microscope if necessary. Kowloon, believe it or not. Oh, never. Cross my heart. Oh. In our fats place. But that funny little curio shop. Mm. We always look closed. Yes, well, it wasn't always. Just before we sailed, I made up my mind to buy you that brooch for Christmas. Oh. <laughs> but what extravagant. You really like it? Oh, I adore it. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> It really is. It's perfect. And it really is going to be a happy Christmas, isn't it? Yes, of course it is. But the best thing we can do is to forget we ever heard those those awful voices. It was just a bad dream. Now, let's say it'll be something to talk about when we've been here long enough to have friends in for bridge and dinner and long chats by the fire. Yeah. <laughs> they won't come back, will they, the voices? Perhaps Wedderburn was wrong. How do you mean? Well, remember he said that the Maitlands were quite extraordinarily happy here. Well, perhaps they weren't at all. Perhaps it was... Oh, I don't know. It sounds crazy, but perhaps it was the Colonel and his wife we heard quarrelling here. Oh, Dick. It can't be possible. That man, that George, he had the voice of a, a self-indulgent counter-jumper. Well, no officer would speak to his wife like that. But she sounded far from prepossessing herself. Perhaps he married the wrong sort of woman and uh, took to the bottle. 
Anyway, let's forget them. It's England and it's Christmas. What could be nicer? You weren't missing it then, truly. Oh, the life out there. The South China Sea. Those lovely cruises. Your work. Oh, the evenings at the club. Missing it? If we'd stayed in Hong Kong a year longer, we'd never have had the energy to leave. We'd have gone the way of the Elliots oh. and the Philipsons oh. and the Colfaxes. Oh. Dyspeptic and discreetly alcoholic China watchers. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, the turkey must be ready by now, ah, and I'm ravenous. I've been dreaming about the turkey for days. Come on. I've laid the table in the dining room oh. rather specially. Oh. I wanted it to be a surprise for you. The colonel left some excellent silver. The table looks quite beautiful. Just like a regimental guest night. <laughs> I'm not the only one to keep a secret up my sleeve. We're so lucky we've got the colonel's thing so reasonably. All right, darling. Let's go and see what you've been up to in the dining room. Right then, let's see this big surprise. Do you seriously expect me to eat that? God's sake, woman, what the hell have you been doing all morning? What have I been doing all morning? Oh, you make me sick. No. You really make me oh, sick with no. the rest of male chauvinism of Close the door. Do you Close it. Why you and... Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Voices and no one there. They're taking over those things, whatever they are. They're taking over our house. Is there someone there? Uh, excuse me, is there someone there? Good afternoon, Padre. Uh, where exactly? Ah, uh, oh, there you are. I'm afraid I couldn't see you for a moment. Well, a very happy Christmas to you both. You're remarkably early for the service, but welcome to our church. Uh, Padre, I'm sorry we haven't introduced ourselves earlier, but we've been occupied with moving in these past few weeks. Uh, I know exactly how it is, and I'm delighted to see you here this day of all days. But moving in uh, to a house in Treem, <laughs> you must forgive me for not having called on you. I had no idea. We're at our wit's end. I beg your pardon? Our house is... Well, this is no exaggeration. Our house is haunted by two hateful and malicious people. It's true. It's absolutely true. They've driven us out of our home and they're driving us out of our minds. Yes. Uh, my name's Collett, Thomas Collett. Uh, Dick and Alison Lennox. Mm. How do you do, sir? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Lennox, I'm sorry our first meeting should have occurred because of something so unpleasant. What I can't understand is why Mr. Wedderburn didn't warn us. Would only have been fair. Wedderburn? You, you said Mr. Wedderburn? The estate agent who sold us the house. But when was this? November. Mr. J.S. Wedderburn of Witchwood? Yes. But Mrs. Lennox, Mr. John Summers Wedderburn has been dead for a quarter of a century. What? I officiated at his funeral myself. Where he was a close friend of my father's. No, I'm sorry, but that can't be possible. Mr. Wedderburn met us at his office in the high street of Witchwood, showed us photographs of some properties, then motors us over to Treem himself. He sold us the house we're living in. We have the title deeds to prove it. Uh, that office that your husband mentioned in the High Street of Witchwood has been part of a supermarket for almost ten years. What on earth is a supermarket? Well, it's probably something they've introduced while we were abroad, darling. Something like an emporium, perhaps. Um, whereabouts in Treem is the house you bought? Chaloners. Chaloners? Uh, and when did you move in? Three weeks ago. To the day. I see. Uh, these ghosts that have distressed you so much, could you describe them? Well, not their physical appearance, no, because we never see them. But we hear them in the room with us, vindictive and coarse and utterly degrading. The absurd thing is they have such ordinary, such reassuring names. George and Daphne. J. 
George and Daphne. You're certain of that? Absolutely. Mr. Collett, we've been subjected to three of these visitations. These dreadful people are called George and Daphne. There can be no doubt about it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, Amen. My children, my very dear children, in your fear, in your terror, you came to this church seeking God's comfort. You did right. You did well. Because you're going to need God's comfort and reassurance more than you can possibly know. I'm relieved to know you're taking us seriously. How can I do otherwise when yours is quite the most devastating and appalling predicament I've ever encountered in my years in the ministry? Let me deal plainly with you. George and Daphne Evans bought Challoners six years ago as a weekend and holiday retreat from London. They are living there now. Well, no, Padre, my wife and it's I... It's not, I'm afraid, the happiest of marriages, but they are living there. Padre, I'm afraid you... I saw them myself going up the drive in their new car not a couple of hours ago. We bought the house from Colonel Maitland through Mr. Wedderburn in November. Oh, November of what year, oh, my dear Lord? Give me your wisdom. Collett, what's the matter with you? Well, how do I say it? How in the name of gentle Jesus do I tell you? It's not George and Daphne who are ghosts at Chaloners, but you too. In the spirit of the house, the cast was Dick Lennox, Bernard Brown, Alison Lennox, Sheila Grant, Wedderburn, Norman Bird, George Evans, David Goodland, Daphne Evans, Carol Boyd, and the Reverend Collett, Alan Dudley. The spirit of the house was written by Michael Robson and directed by Jerry Jones. And just a reminder that the technical quality of that was as it was because that was a lost recording that had been lovingly restored. So aren't we lucky to hear that? That's an early Christmas present. Now, on Christmas Day on 4 Extra, we have the start of an across-the-week airing of an adaptation of Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's Good Omens, which has an amazing cast, including Peter Serafinovitz, Mark Heap, Josie Lawrence, Patterson Joseph, Colin Morgan. The list goes on and stays pretty incredible throughout till he gets to Nick Briggs. No, he's marvellous. Uh, and uh, I'm only ribbing him just in case he's listening to this. Is he listening to this? I don't know. Probably not. No, of course he does. He likes good sci-fi. But does he listen to this when he's not on it? I don't know. Can his ego take it? I'm ribbing him, of course. He's a marvellous fellow. I don't know whether he listens or not. I don't know what he gets up to in his spare time. I don't know what any of the Seventh Dimension presenters get up to in their spare time. Apart from me, I know what I get up to, although I forget big tracts of it anyway uh, it concludes in next Saturday seventh dimension but make sure you listen to the first five episodes which preceded it in the week beforehand I haven't been drinking you're leaving the seventh dimension okay well we'll see you at the old year next week on the seventh dimension as well as the aforementioned good omens on the Saturday Sunday's treats are a favorite of mine fear on four because I never fail to be lured in by the honeyed danger of Edward de Souza's rich and textured tones of terror and there's a oh, whistle and I'll come to you MR James's famous fright fest which will ensure your crossing into 2018 is a far from reassuring one but until then may I Toby Haydock wish you a sincere and very Merry Christmas from me and all of the team it's only one other the person actually Moy the producer here in the seventh dimension the only place where we were obliged to point out that Santa is an anagram of Satan ha 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 now you may leave out a mince pie and a carrot on your annual nighttime visitation you might but me I pop a sacrificial goat on a pentagram doily and hope for the worst night night